Johnson & Johnson CFO Joseph Wolk for more on the company's quarter. By the way, we should mention he's also a member of the CNBC Global CFO Council. Uh, Joseph, thanks for being with us this morning. Meg just set it up. You raised your sales guidance, uh, not your earnings per share. First, let's dig into the sales guidance raise. Alex Gorski, I know, made some comments that it's the pipeline uh, that's uh, and the strong company guidance, uh, the strong company pipeline that he is using for this guidance. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, good, good morning, Becky. It's a pleasure to be here and discuss the results with you. So we did take up our top line guidance, uh, given the first half strength that we saw, specifically in our pharmaceutical unit, where the pipeline does continue to deliver. We're bringing new medicines to patients most in need, uh, extending uh, the, the package inserts on some of the, the products that have been successful to date. We see improving trends in medical devices and consumers. So uh, we're very uh, encouraged by what we saw in the first half, and that prompted us to raise guidance for the top line. Uh, for the balance of this year. That also portends very well for 2020 and beyond. If you think about how we came into this year facing biosimilar uh, and generic uh, competition in our pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical units specifically, we were looking at three to three and a half billion dollars. We've held up a little bit better than that. Uh, so most companies would be talking about contraction with that type of headwind. We're able to, to uh, uh, talk about growth just based on the strength of our pipeline. So why not raise your earnings per share guidance as well? Yeah, so if you look at w our earnings growth this year, uh, we're maintaining it at two times the rate of sales growth. We think that's very healthy, and we look to the long term. So this gives us a great opportunity to invest uh, in our portfolio to either accelerate, fortify, or even add to our pipeline going forward so that we do solidify not just the next six months, but many, many more years to come. Meaning that you could use this for mergers and acquisitions? Uh, investment in our, our, our current pipeline, uh, as well as adding to uh, our existing pipeline. We want to make sure there's a, a strategic right to win, so we've got to have a scientific expertise, a commercial capability that makes sense. But we're always on the lookout to adding to our portfolio in a meaningful way. Joe, it looks like in the in the quarter your U.S. business declined 2.2 percent operationally, while, whereas overseas uh, it increased 5.5 percent. And it looks like U.S. pharma was down 2 percent operationally. Is that what drove uh, U.S. declining? And, and is that driven by sort of drug pricing pressure, or what's going on with the U.S.? Yeah, so there's two factors at play, Meg. I mentioned the generic and biosimilar competition. We're experiencing that mostly in the U.S. Uh, again, we think that's still very strong performance given the size of our portfolio. But the growth that we do have, uh, as you note, is um, driven by volume for transformational medicines and not price. So we had 6% price declines in, in 2018. We're seeing the same thing through the first half of, of 2019 at this point. So again, we think that bodes very well that our products are being received well in the marketplace by physicians and patients, uh, and we're not relying on price. So give us your response to uh, the report that came out on Friday that affected J&J stock, driving it down about 5%. I mean, that was about $15 billion at one point in market cap that it got erased on this report. You guys said it wasn't new news. You already disclosed the subpoena. But uh, what is your response to this report from Bloomberg that the uh, Department of Justice has opened a criminal investigation? Yeah. So, you know, uh, given that it's a tell question, uh, I'm, I, I feel I need to say that the product is safe. It's been uh, proven so and validated by not just Johnson & Johnson, but by many respected uh, agencies, uh, government agencies, institutions uh, for many, many decades now. Uh, with respect to the report on Friday, I would say it's not new news. We disclosed this in our SEC filing back in February, and the surprise, if anything, was the fact that it was considered news. But we're complying fully and cooperating fully with the Department of Justice. It's an astute organization. I'm sure once they go through the facts, they'll come to the same conclusions that the company acted responsibly and that the product is safe. And, of course, you are also dealing with a lot of different lawsuits, thousands of lawsuits uh, around the country on this, and you're, you're sort of battling those one by one. I understand you have set aside some legal funds dedicated to those talcum powder outcomes. Can you tell us how much you've set aside? Yeah, so in the quarter, we recorded a charge of uh, about $190 million. But to be very clear, that is not related to any settlement or liability payments. That is related specifically to uh, costs to defend ourselves. All right. Can you tell us what you're setting aside beyond that for uh, things that could come in the future? Yeah, at this point, Meg, if you look at the, the talc uh, 
the litigation when we've uh, lost on an original verdict. We've prevailed on appeal. We continue to think that that's the right path for us right now. There will be times, you know, as a CFO, I can consider cost as a, a potential settlement opportunity. But our overarching strategy is to continue to defend our ourselves for this product when the facts are so overwhelmingly on our side. A as you know, you know, you've had um, a plaintiff attorney on your panel, uh, and this is big business, unfortunately, for plaintiff's attorneys, where they target successful companies who value their reputation in hopes of a large legal settlement, much of which of that payment goes to the plaintiff's attorneys themselves. Joseph, so we're going to defend oh, sorry, ourselves. Go ahead. Uh, what, what about the situation with the opioids? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you consider that in the same sort of um, uh, framework? It's, it's a little bit different, but it's the same uh, type of framework, I, I guess, is a good way to put it, Becky. If you think about uh, uh, the Oklahoma case, now, we, we readily admit there's a, an, an opioid epidemic that needs to be solved by many parties, and it has to be multifactorial in terms of its solution set. Um, but here, the facts don't align uh, to the claims that the state is making. The facts being that Johnson & Johnson products based on Oklahoma's own Medicaid reimbursement records were less than 1% uh, related to Johnson & Johnson products, products that were designed to prevent ab abuse and have proven to do so. Even the plaintiff's attorneys, uh, as I understand it throughout the case, have said many, many times, this is not about Johnson & Johnson's products, it's about there being an opioid uh, epidemic. Hey, Joseph, let's talk about your pop pipeline. I know a lot of people are curious about uh, the new drug that you have for that depression-resistant treatments that have been out there in the past, yeah. Spravato. What have you seen in the early commercialization? Yeah, we're, we're very thrilled about Spravato. It's going to be meaningful for our business, but we're actually more excited for the patients who will benefit from this. Um, you know, Treatment-resistant depression hasn't had anything new in terms of treatment in over 30 years. It's the leading cause of suicide. We're seeing great uptake. It's, um, it's administered by the patient themselves, but under the supervision of a clinic. So there's a process of certifying those clinics. We've got 1,600 uh, clinics certified here within the U.S., and we're looking forward to the benefits it could provide to patients who suffer from treatment-resistant depression uh, and their families. Is that a different uh, uh, mode of action than, than the typical antidepressant? Yes. Joe, how's it work? Uh, it's a glutamate modulator, so yeah. it reconnects the, the neurons. It's intranasal delivery. Uh, with very limited side effects. Uh, and what we love about it, Joe, is that uh, where with the, the typical treatments that were out there to date, it would take two to three months to see if, whether it was effective or not. Here we're seeing positive benefits within sometimes hours, but certainly within days. So there's a, a whole patient population. What, the, 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 what is, this, is the standard mode still SSRIs? And, and, it is. And, okay, and so they, they don't respond to any of them, or do they... Respond yeah, to some so, for a while so, and then stop, or how? how but I'm right. not that familiar with it. Yeah, so the indication is for treatment resistant depression. So they have failed um, two SSRIs, if you will, okay. over a period of time. So they may see some benefit for a while, but it's not sustaining, and sometimes they don't see any benefit at all. So you relaunched your baby line in the U.S. last year, trying to appeal to, to folks who want more natural products, uh, fewer of certain ing ingredients. How's that relaunch going? It's going well, Meg. If you look at uh, the, the major countries in which we relaunched last year, we're seeing strong, uh, close to double-digit consumption growth. So there's inventory fluctuations that are uh, impacting some of the reported results, but we're very pleased that we're hitting the right chord with millennial moms and dads. And as you look to build out your pipeline or, or any part of your business, not just drugs, where are you looking at potential M&A? Uh, we're looking at all parts uh, uh, of the business, uh, and we always do. Uh, we're very excited about what we can add um, in our pharmaceutical pipeline. Uh, earlier this year, we added a, a compound for our genics, a CD70, which is going to hopefully treat uh, AML and MDS down the road. We're extremely excited about the um, medical device uh, segment and where we invest it in Aros Health. Uh, that's in digital robotic surgery. That's an emerging trend, one of the highest growth areas within the medical device segment. And we're very pleased, not just with the capabilities that we'll get with their products, but the expertise we're bringing over to that team. We'll be able to provide digital surgery across a number of platforms, whether it be uh, bronchoscopies, endoscopies, uh, uh, orthopedics, as well as general surgery. Joseph, thank you for your time today. It's good seeing you. We really appreciate your coming on. And Meg, thank you.